video standpoint. Yeah, yeah. Talk today that um, I wanted to give was around investor presentations. And let me just, uh, I, really what I'd love for you to take away, I'm hoping to give you more than just, okay, in a presentation, do X, Y, Z. Uh, sometimes founders will ask me, so how do I uh, give the perfect pitch so that I can raise money? And a lot of times what, what we tell them is, you know, there are definitely ways you can deliver your pitch well, communicate well, get across key points. A lot of it is it's where your company's at, what you built, what market you're going after, and that's harder to sort of you know optimize. So th this is the uh, intro, so I can uh, skip this slide. Uh, so some caveats about this presentation. One, it's not really about fundraising strategy. That's really a whole nother talk about when's the right time to raise money? How much should I raise? Who do I raise it from? Tactically, how do I do it? Strategy of how much you ask for, things of that sort. Um, there's, there is a bias in this presentation towards probably early stage presentations. I think if you are a growth company with 10, 20, $50 million in revenue, you're raising a Series C or you're trying to raise private equity, uh, I think some of these principles will hold, but it's uh, probably uh, there will be differences. So, so it's a bias towards the early stage. Uh, if you're uh, presenting to an accelerator or a pre-seed seed fund, maybe a Series A firm. Um, as I said, it may not work with pitch competitions. If you're doing a pitch competition, uh, definitely follow their format and, and their guidance. And definitely, it, this is not your customer and sales pitch. Uh, that uh, really, if you think about it as like code bases or presentation bases, you really should have two different bases. One is uh, sort of a pitch for investors and one is a pitch for customers. And, there, and again, that's probably a separate presentation. But sometimes the mistake I see is, oh, okay, we've been doing these investor pitches first and now we're gonna go talk to customers. Let me modify my um, investor pitch uh, for customers. I think a couple of other principles that I'm gonna talk about and related to today's presentation is I'm not gonna give you the, the absolute format. So it's again, it's not gonna be a prescriptive, here's the 12 slides you need in this order. Um, I, I do talk about that, but a lot of this is geared towards for you to think about some of the guiding principles behind uh, what an investor looks for in a presentation, and then think about how do you tell the best story uh, for your company, uh, given where your company's at, what are the unique strengths of your company and, and what stage you're at. And so, as I said, the key is the most effectively communicate your story. So um, a couple of frameworks. I think how many of you've heard of Guy Kawasaki, the 10, 20, 30 rule? It's, it's a pretty famous framework for um, investor presentations. And generally it holds true pretty well. It says, here's the things that you should talk about. Um, problem, solution, business model, why you're unique, how are you going to get customers, competition, team, you know, and I think if you were to look at a lot of different frameworks, you know, many of these elements would be on there. They might be in different orders, things of like that, but this isn't a bad place to start. I'll share, I'll share with you another one, one that um, from last year, uh, Rob Go, Next Few Ventures, they're a seed fund in Boston. Uh, they're very good in general about uh, sharing, they're trying to show transparency in fundraising for entrepreneurs, sharing that in blogs, uh, on Twitter. Uh, definitely recommend uh, him as someone to follow and read. In fact, I, I quote him later in the presentation. This is his framework. Um, you know, probably some of the same elements, but there's, uh, you can see it doesn't quite map to the classic frameworks. But if you were to pitch them, you know, this is probably, you'd want to make sure your presentation was in this format. And so I think the point is, if you do a Google search, you can see everyone's you know, got a framework. Here's Guy Kawasaki, and there's a lot of that. So again, my goal is not to say, here's the one and only one, but I will share sort of my framework or the way I think about it and how we talk to companies about it that we've invested in, uh, especially uh, companies in uh, the Alpha Lab and Alpha Lab gear accelerators. So at a high level, you, you have to have this compelling vision and market opportunity. And, and this is, you know, I'm gonna show the and part of it because sometimes um, this is where 
founders say, you know, I get confused because I get conflicting feedback. And my goal is to show you how maybe it doesn't quite conflict. And, you know, you have to have evidence that you're the one that's going to win this opportunity. And it's really not either or. You really need to show both. And then the evidence are the things that, that you often hear about. You know, that you've got this great team, that you really understand the market and the customer problems, that your product's unique, uh, traction, momentum, uh, the customer acquisition, and the funding plan. I'm going to spend the rest of this presentation talking about each of those elements. But the reason I wanted to highlight the and and show both is sometimes what we'll hear from companies is, hey, you know, I'm getting feedback that my it's not a big enough problem or it's um, not a big enough opportunity. And they say, well, it, but yet at the same time, they, they hear, hey, you're not focused enough. And sometimes they see that as a trade-off. Hey, how do I both show something that's big, a big market, I'm going to go dominate the world and show focus. And so I do think it's important to highlight that sometimes that comes across as conflicting feedback for founders. Um, that uh, if you show too much focus and you know you show a tactical plan of how you're going to execute this market segment that you're going to go after, then you're going to get they're going to get frustrated saying, "Gosh, you know your your market's not big enough." And then at the same time, if all you do is talk about the market division and you don't show some of that execution and that focus and segmentation, then you're going to say, "Oh, it it sounds not focused enough." So I think the key is you have to recognize that both matter and and this highlight. Both, you know, you don't want to spend your whole presentation just talking vision. Uh, you want to paint the vision or the market opportunity and then get into specific execution. So think of it that way. So any questions before I kind of dive into the specifics? Sure. Sure. So the question was, you know, with the different formats, would, would I recommend um, investigating a VC firm before pitching them? Absolutely. I think, you know, that would just probably fall under, uh, you know, the research you would want to do about them. But to the extent that they have shared, you know, and sometimes you, now you, you're not going to have every firm's going to say, here's our format, but it, you, you could probably see um, what they say is their philosophy or their criteria. So, so to some extent, um, you can map to a little bit, but even then, I, I probably wouldn't overdo it because if it feels forced on your end and it, it just looks like you mapped your presentation to their exact format, that may actually make it less effective. So, so let me just kind of go into each of these and try to give a little bit more description of what it means because sometimes, um, when I've heard other presentations or, you know, I, I get frustrated that, well, everyone says that. I'm going to try not to do that and just kind of say the same thing that everyone says, but try to give you a little bit more specifics uh, to, to show what it means. Um, okay, so I actually talked about the market opportunity and vision. So, so it is, you know, this one is the unique point of view. So it's not just, hey, it's a big market, but that you have some specific take on that market which makes it interesting or compelling um, to the investor. Now, sometimes it may be a, a market opportunity that uh, I just haven't heard of. You know, sometimes that gets my attention, or it's it's you know an idea that seems to go a little bit counter to what might be traditional conventional wisdom. I know in Peter Thiel's book Zero to One, um, there's a, a a premise that he puts out, and I've heard some investors say that they love asking, was, you know, what, what do you believe or what's your deeply held belief about your market and no one else believes it? So, so that's a, a way of kind of getting into the uniqueness. And then obviously, you know, the, the large and growing market. So I think this is, again, I say, from a vision standpoint, you know, you need to show how your company can grow into other markets, can be applicable to sp uh, spread from this market segment to that one and so forth. But Back to the execution standpoint, you're initially focused, you know, laser focused on a segment and really proving it out. And from there, you expand. So why do investors care? You know, especially VC firms, I mean, a lot of their model, and this is another probably separate talk, you know, their model is predicated on these outsized returns. They, they, they factor into their investment model. They need to make money for their LPs. 
and for their LPs, uh, limited partners to invest in their fund, right? They have the belief that the returns from this VC fund are going to be greater than what they could do and, you know, save for securities. And, um, and if you also factor in the expected failure rate of startups, you know, there's, you know, there's a lot of thoughts that, you know, every single investment that a fund makes needs to sort of return the fund. So, so those are some of the principles behind it, why market size is so important because, uh, uh, an investor may look at a company and say, you know, this could be a successful company. I could see this company getting to, you know, 25 million a year in revenues, maybe a hundred million dollar exit. Uh, and based off that particular firm's fund economics, that may not make sense. That may be too small an opportunity for them. Um, and then, you know, so, some of it that relates to this potential returns, you know, ability to change the industry. And, and they are trying to figure out how big is, is the team thinking. So team. So again, you hear this every time, probably every everyone who comes in here and says, we focus on team or team matters. And I'm not saying it doesn't, but let me try to give a little bit more flavor to that. So I think one is unique qualifications. You know, uh, I th I, my guess is that everyone in this room on some um, absolute bar level is very qualified and very high caliber um, person. But uh, a lot of times they're looking for the unique qualifications. So it's unique to the opportunity that you're going after. Sometimes they call it, um, uh, let's see, product market, a founder market fit. So, so therefore, if you're going after um, a B2B industry where uh, you really need some unique expertise in that industry that, that you have that, or if you're doing a consumer facing product that uh, maybe someone in your team has done monetization at Snapchat before, or things like that. So, so it's really unique qualifications. They, they are looking at your execution to date. A lot of times from an investor standpoint, they're trying to assess the risk with their investment about your ability to execute. So the idea is just part of the equation, but really trying to predict, you know, can this team execute? Can this team actually do all the things that's gonna be needed to, to win that opportunity? And if they don't know you, um, then what you've done to date, you know, the product you've built so far, the initial traction you have are proxies for that execution. Uh, as an aside, even how you engage with them as part of an investment process, your ability to sort of sell them on the opportunity, your follow-up, those are proxies for execution. And that is also why sometimes investors are willing to invest earlier in a repeat founder, especially a, a founding team that they've backed before, is because in their minds, that risk of execution is, is lower because they've, they've invested in them before they, they know how they work. Um, team chemistry. Uh, they're looking at not only the composition of the team, uh, do they have the right skill sets? Is there too much redundancy? Are there gaps? But if you are at a point where your team is in the meeting, you know, even team chemistry. And, and that's, that's where it's hard because it, it can go both ways. Uh, if you have a scenario where the CEO does all the talking and the other two you know, co-founders don't say a word, that's going to come across negatively. Like, okay, you know, it's going to raise flags like, okay, you know, is this really a cohesive team? But if you have all three founders like fighting over each other to talk and get airtime, and sometimes repeating each other's words, that's going to raise a red flag too, because it's going to say, oh boy, they're not on the same page. Um, I, I know one time, um, I know a company, and this is a while ago, so it's not anyone you know, but a company lost the VC investment because uh, the VC picked up on this dynamic in one of the meetings and then asked to do due diligence, like one-on-one -on -one interviews with all the key members of the management team, and then realized that they actually had slightly different visions about the strategy, what needed to be done. So, so, so that, that's you know, just to show you an example of that. Coachability. This is a hard one too, because again, you probably hear that all the time, coachability, coachability. And what is that? Um, and that's, you know, it definitely is not just automatically Agreeing with what the investor suggests, or you know, agreeing you know with him or her. I mean, that's um, th that's not it. I think it's just you know, it's your process for thinking. It's your way to engage. How open are you to the feedback? How do you respond to it? How do you reflect upon it? In some ways, it also translates into how receptive are you to the market feedback? Are you you know 
dead set, like this is my vision, this is the way it's gonna be, and you sort of ignore data you're getting, or uh, are, are you receptive to it? I think that's just one element of, of coachability. Okay, understanding of the customer problem. So again, you'll often hear the market, the customer problem. So what's advanced understanding? And I'll just kind of put all of these up there, oops. You know, it's, it's really that level of detail. Like I, I know for me, when I'm meeting with um, a team, I'd like to really, you know, I expect to know less than them. In fact, you know, because, unless it's an area that I actually know because of my background, I expect to know less than the people I'm meeting with. I'm hoping I'm gonna learn and it's back to those unique insights that I talked about earlier in that they can get to a level of depth. You, you can, and it, this is the part that's hard to explain, but you can sort of feel it. Like when, when, when a company either has a hundred customers or they've talked to hundred and they're getting into nuances about the differences between this market segment versus that segment. And you know, we're gonna go after this segment first because they actually value this benefit over this other one, that's the benefit we can build first. So when the whole plan comes together and it ties together along with the market segmentation, you, you, you can just sense that they really not just have intellectually studied this market, but, but they know it and, and that it's integrated throughout all of their plans and strategies. Um, I think second one related to it is you know the initial customers. Can you define it to a level that you know, I could almost describe to you, like this is what our ideal initial customer looks like. So that, and this has all sorts of benefits is that if you can identify them, then you can develop strategies to reach them. When you're asking for intros for mentors or people you meet, you can be more specific. You know, uh, it's like, I'm looking for the brand manager at retail and, and consumer products companies, especially in the sports, outdoor sports, and I don't know, wildlife space or something like that versus, well, I'm looking for someone at a consumer company. I mean, you know, so if you were on the receiving end of that, trying to think about, do you know someone to help, you know, a company, you know, which one are you more likely to be able to respond to? So, so I think that's, that's important. And then the last one is sort of how intense is the problem? So I think a lot of times, no one's doubting that there's a problem, but how big is that problem and how, how high a priority is it, how intense is it? And because that's gonna make the difference between them maybe um, uh, creating budget to buy your solution or changing behavior to adopt your solution versus like, well, that's, that's cool, but eh, I, I, I like what I'm doing well enough. So I think that's, that's a, and so a lot of times you need to convey this sense uh, to investors uh, around the opportunity you're going after. How am I doing on time? Okay, yes, yeah, sure. How do you balance the genius idea of the debt and the debt Right, no, I, I, Right. Yeah. Um, did everyone hear the question? You know, it's sort of like balancing. And you know, there's in general the whole idea of balance is is the hardest thing because it's you know uh, it's a, everything's a spectrum and you know, it's 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 sort of like music you know like a, a music keyboard and you're trying to adjust the dials to be just right to tune the music. I think it's similar. But um, in your case, I think what you want to do is think about if you're engaging with an investor, where you are in that process. So it's you know, the first you know, meeting, the elevator pitch, it's the high level kind of to draw them in to that compelling vision or narrative. And then you assume that, first of all, they're not going to write a check you know, in that first meeting. So then you kind of think you, you let them also sort of um, dive in and, and go deeper on some of the areas. So that's, yeah. I'm sorry? Do I discuss the solution? Um, yes, I mean, that is part of it, but I actually do think making sure that, um, that folks buy into the problem, the, the market opportunity or problem is more important. So I know when we've 
worked with companies on their demo day pitches or um, or just investor pitches in general, we probably spend a lot of time trying to get the narrative right around what's the problem in the market and what's the opportunity. Uh, because you know, if, you, if, if I don't buy into the fundamental premise, then I don't care how good your solution is. Like, because um, uh, unless it's like a platform technology that's fundamentally going to have applications across numerous industries. I think there was another question. Yeah, that's a good question. How much spin to put in a pitch? I think two, two answers there. One, it's not directly related to spin, but I always say, look, you, you want to put your best foot forward and you want to show a bit of sort of that marketing, you know, I mean, so you don't want to, um, I used to work at Hewlett Packard and there was a joke about our internal marketing that uh, if we were marketing sushi, we would call it cold dead fish. You've probably heard that. Um, uh, I forgot this is being recorded. Oh, well. Uh, no, that's okay. It was a while ago. Uh, but so, so you, you know, you do want to sort of put your best foot forward. But what I always tell um, founders about the pitch is whatever you put on the slide, right? Even if it's at a pitch competition, you know, it has to be able to stand up to that next level of questioning. So if an investor came up to you afterwards and said, hey, you talked about those 10 customers. Tell me more about them. If you sort of spun it or you sort of, um, you know, were forward looking on some of it, then that's not going to hold up well. So, so I think that's one way to look at it. I think in terms of change the world, that's probably one um, that I would probably be careful of. I mean, I think you'd rather sh you know, sort of show it in other ways than declare it because there are certain terms that probably do get overused. Um, and, and that's that's probably one. And then you also have to remember that investors, uh, especially VC firms or active angels, um, they, they hear so many pitches that that there's things that they've probably heard dozens of times or, you know, so they've almost become jaded or cynical when they hear it and you may not realize it. And and I think I, I remember the first time I did a pitch or a presentation, I, I did a few things in there and then once I got on this side of the table and I started hearing pitches, I, I, I think back like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I had that in my first, you know, investor presentation. You know, it was embarrassing to think about, but I didn't know that at the time. So, um, did, did I capture that? Okay. So product. Okay. So this was, you know, kind of about product or solution. Um, so I think here, you know, so now if you do have, if you have defined the problem and there is this buy-in that there's a problem, the next one is, well, how well does your particular solution solve it? So it's, uh, and, and, you know, and I think related to that, uh, a lot of times you'll hear about, what, do you have a patent? You know, usually that'll be a question you'll hear first. Really, I think in some ways what's being asked is that's another proxy for, is it unique, is it defensible? So if you're doing a software-based product, you may not have a patent. It may not even make sense for you from a strategy standpoint, you know, to go get a patent, but you know, they do want to understand, you know, do you have IP protection or how do you prevent someone else from just simply copying and replicating what you do? Um, and as I said, you know, is it differentiation between features? Sometimes when, when I'll ask a question around differentiation, I will get answers back that are feature based, which, you know, they're not as satisfying because I'd actually rather hear an answer that's based off a fundamental difference in approach or some underlying technology. Um, I think the first, you know, if I had to kind of rank the answers that don't resonate, at the top level might be, well, their UI stinks. You know, the competitor in the market, their UI stinks as ours is better. And my immediate thought is, but they, they are already in the market. They, they're probably getting the feedback that their UI stinks and there's probably a team right now fixing that. So, so you know, that, and then it's like features. And then, and then the other one that doesn't usually resonate with, with me is, oh, well, they only do this. We're going to do all of this. And, and you know, it's the, the, the value of integration of all the systems, which I, I, I'm a little bit skeptical of because, um, a lot of times you, you need an entry point with a particular system or a particular um, solving a problem before you can then spread. Um, 
And then finally, more of the proof is you know, then around the engagement metrics or ROI. If it's a more consumer facing product, definitely it's you know, active usage, whether it's on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, uh, user growth, how often are they using it? If it's more aimed at businesses, it's probably similar engagement metrics. Are people using it? Sometimes if the product's aimed at completing a transaction, you know, are transactions happening? Um, I think, uh, are, how many of you are familiar with No Wait? And, and I've met Rob. So I, I, one of their key engagement metrics were simply how many diners were seated using their app. And, and that became a very simple way, uh, you know, of sh and, and one, it was an impressive number because they got into the millions and you know, tens of millions. But two, it also uh, demonstrated that, um, that the product was doing what it was supposed to do. So, so I think that those are some things. And then ROI, especially if you're selling to companies, then uh, not only did you implement the product, it's, it's working, but then you can measure the cost savings. And so, so that becomes a key selling point uh, uh, beyond the initial early adopters. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So the question is, if there's a regulatory risk or an industry change, should you bring it up? I actually think, in general, yes. Now, is it in the first five minutes or in the second meeting. Uh, now sometimes, so there's, there's two problems. Industry changes or regulations is often a good thing for a startup if, if you're taking advantage of the opportunity. And in fact, that becomes part of your market opportunity because again, one of the questions that investors are often thinking when you're pitching to them is, well, why now? Especially if, if your business model isn't that unique, um, and it, it feels like a type of company that could have existed five, 10 years ago. Um, you know, probably to use an overused example, the Uber for whatever these days, right? Um, 10 years ago, it was like the social network for this, you know, or a marketplace models. Those are ones where, you know, it, the natural question is like, well, why hasn't this problem been solved? You know, you assume that people, you know, are smart and that there's lots of smart folks around the world right now trying to solve these problems. So. So, so that's the question. Now, with the regulatory thing, that becomes things like, hey, you know, in 2017, this regulation happened. This has created this opportunity in the industry. Now, if if you now for life sciences products, your regulatory path way now becomes an issue that investors are going to focus on. Just as often with hardware and software, you're going to say, well, what's your path to market? How are you going to launch uh, with life sciences products? They're going to say, well, what do you what do you need to do to get animal data? What do you need to do to get FDA approval? Um, those are the things that probably become potential barriers that the investors are going to hone in on. Um, oops. So the other thing you hear about all the time, traction, traction, traction. And uh, again, trying to define traction just like, you know, what do you mean by you want a good team? I think that's, that's hard and every investor is different. Um, but I think some of the things is how quickly you're moving. I think that sometimes gets lost. I mean, you know, I, uh, uh, entrepreneurs may kind of hear, hey, I need to get the 10,000 a month in monthly revenues, or I need to get the million a year in revenues, or I need to get to 10,000, 100,000 users. And that's just one part of the equation. It's also the growth rate that you get there. You know, I know we had a company that um, applied to our accelerator that probably had 50,000 um, downloads and users, which was would have been on the high end of companies you know, that we accept at the accelerator stage. But when we dug in, you know, the company had launched about three years ago. They gotten a lot of those, most of those downloads in the first two years because of some other things that weren't replicable. And you know, we actually sensed that the momentum was sort of going in the wrong direction. So, so I think that's just an example to illustrate. But customers' revenues. How did you get those customers? And I'll talk more about that on the next slide. And then also, it's always a quantity and quality trade-off. So I think for every metric you're thinking about, that's a quantitative metric for how much, um, for how, you know, how many, how much revenues or how many customers or users. There has to be a quality metric of, you know, are are those really good customers or users? And and the engagement metrics measure that. 
Uh, I talked about growth rate engagement. And then the baseline is uh, investors will often kind of track. I mean, even now, if you're meeting with investors that are dropping by here, and even if they, it's clear in the meeting that they're not going to invest for at least a year, you know, most of them will track. You know, they met with you, you were at this point, and then the, you know, next time you interact with them, they'll want to know what your key metrics are, how you're doing. And I think the ones that are sort of maintaining the pace they expect it, or even better, surpassing it, those are the ones that are going to catch their attention. Um, repeatable customer acquisition. I think it's an important concept to bring up. I, I, I think at the very earliest stages, I wouldn't want you to get too hung up on that because I think first is, right, you got to show that regardless of how you sell them, that people care enough to want to use it or buy it. And then after that, you want to start moving towards a more repeatable way of uh, getting customers. Sometimes companies try to skip that early step and try to move to this too quickly, and then um, that can also hurt them. But, but that's when you start having customers that uh, have similar characteristics, that you know how to target them. Now, I think for consumer-facing products, this is very important even earlier because it's costly. You know, you're not going to be able to go get salespeople to go acquire you know, users for a consumer app. So, so how th those, that way of acquiring those users becomes more cr critical. But often for a company that's in the trying to raise a larger seed round or maybe a series A round, they absolutely have to demonstrate this repeatable uh, customer acquisition process. And then um, the last thing was coherent funding plan. So then, you know, here we've talked about all of the things, you know, that your company sort of needs to have to be effective with investors. The funding plan is that part of your slide pitch where you're saying, this is how much we're raising, we're going to use it on these things, and we're going to achieve these goals. A lot of times, I'll just hear, we're raising 500K for 18-month runway. And that's not enough. You've got to paint the picture to the investor of where your company will be at the end of that investment, or probably even more accurately, you know, uh, in that investment with six months to go before you run out of money, because that's presumably when you're going to need to go raise that next round. And so, so here, it's, it's almost like a, a mad lib around, you know, I am raising blank, you know, for these purposes blank, you know, to do this blank so I can blank. And, 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 and typically it's raised the next round, but it could be break even or uh, getting acquired. And, and then the last point here is that, you know, the, the plan has to be realistic, but yet it still has to keep up with the market reality. So you can't necessarily just sandbag it to say, oh, I'm going to hit my plan, but I'm going to show a modest growth rate. And then the last slide I have is around market realities, because I think what also sometimes doesn't get captured and think about fundraising is just the competitive environment you're in. It's, um, I know that often when I'm asked for feedback on why, why didn't you invest in us or why didn't we get into your accelerator, it's not a satisfying answer. Uh, but a lot of times the answer is, you know, from, you know, we have limited dollars from a competition standpoint. There were just other opportunities that we thought were more ready or more compelling. Um, in some cases, there are specific feedback we can give to a company, but I think sometimes that gets overweighted and just the competitive nature of this is underrated. And then the market realities, and I'll show this last slide and then I'll take more questions. Um, I mentioned Next View Ventures. This is a, from a blog post that they put out two years ago. So this, from a time standpoint, it's November of 2019. They're Boston-based. So again, when you, whenever you're trying to get these metrics for what is the market, you've got to look at the location and you've got to look at the time period. Because if the market were to have a downturn, you know, then this may com be completely out of whack. And these were just metrics that they highlighted for what I like about this is it highlights different types of business models. If you're a consumer transactional company, if you're a consumer audience, SaaS, deep tech, what they were seeing that was needed to raise seed and Series A milestones. So, and, and you know, the, the, what I left here in the text are the caveats that look, sometimes you can raise sooner, you know, this is sort of, uh, this gives you a much better chance. If you hit these metrics, that gives you a really good chance of raising the round. But th this is important to know, even if you're not raising a seed round right now. So let's say you're, right now you're raising your initial friends and family round or a pre-seed round. You still have to have a sense for where you're trying to get to 
um, because those investors are going to want to feel like you can raise your next round. So trying to understand what the market is, is a critical factor. And it shows that every company is different in terms of how they're being evaluated. Uh, if, so, so it's not as simple as, oh, I need 10 customers, you know, or I need this much in revenue. The, the underlying business model, the underlying unit economics or profitability of that uh, given business model have an effect on how, how you value it. Actually, with the WeWork struggles right now that have been public, there's been more emphasis on gross profit and profit margins, unit economics. And, uh, but those are all factors that uh, investors may look at uh, when they're uh, deciding you know, your company versus another. So it's very possible that someone next to you has less revenues, less traction, but may uh, have much more receptivity to investors than what you're doing. So that may be a function of, of your market or business model. So I think those were the slides I had. Um, I put my Twitter account there. So I, I do try to share articles that I find are really interesting or that I agree with from so many of the investors uh, that, that blog about this. So if you follow me, you can see that. And that's also my email. So yes, question. Yeah, so that's a good question. So this is the question is about sort of the investor that seems to keep inviting you back for presentations, presumably to learn about your market. Yeah. Do you, in each meeting, are they asking for the same things or is there a progression in like, ideally they would be either picking an area, diving deeper in that area, or there would be a natural progression. Is this an individual investor or a fund? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So lots of questions there. I think it's hard because um, with individual investors, they they all have maybe different backgrounds um, and different levels of experience with investing in startup tech companies. So we do see that sometimes companies get frustrated because you know it, it, what you just described was a, a series of probably unproductive meetings um, that, that wasn't useful. Do I have a great answer? I think a lot of it is maybe in the first meeting, try to under, um, first meeting or even before first meeting, hey, hey, I'd like to learn a little bit more about your investment you know, process or, or your investment, you know, kind of what you're looking for and, and uh, say, hey, you know, kind of what stage do you look for? How much do you typically invest? Do you like to be, um, do you want to participate as part of a round? Do you set the terms? You know, there's probably some qualifying questions you can ask to give yourself a sense for, you know, kind of what you would expect from them. That, that, that would be one suggestion. Or after the first meeting is, you know, ask it, hey, just would like to understand kind of what, what, what's your process or what are the questions that you have to, to try to manage a bit of that. But that, that can be challenging. Yeah, I think when, you know, when they, if they made an offer and if you don't feel like it, um, you know, works for you, I think it's, it's fine to say, um, thank you, you know, thank you for the investment offer. You know, we've looked at it, we've thought about it, but, you know, we don't believe that um, this works for us, you know. 
Well, it depends. I mean, um, if you feel like it's in the ballpark where it may be worth countering offering, but it, it, it so you could say, hey, yeah, we were, we believe our valuation is this. <laughs> to the extent that you have comparables or things you can point to that would justify that, that, that would be better, but uh, that, that would be one, one suggestion. Now, if it's, if they come in and it's, you know, just way off, then you may be better off just to politely saying no. Yes. Projections. Oh, so the question is about financial projections. Um, that's a that's a great question, and I'm trying to think what was the context. Where was I? Is it here? Yeah. So projections. What I'm going to say, you know, um, may be different from what others will tell you. Uh, so this is again more me. I I look really hard at the budget and expense side. I I look at the you know, sort of growth projections. But there, what I care about more is the underlying assumptions by how you got there. So so I think that's um, how I look at it. Uh, and, and some of it is I'm looking at your financial model to even understand when you're expecting to incur a cost to make sure you have flexibility and that costs, costs are incurring when the business growth justifies it as opposed to an arbitrary point in time. Like I'd rather you say, hey, I'm going to go bring on, I don't know, I'm going to spend more marketing dollars once I hit this user base or whatever, then I'm going to do it in January. Um, I, and in fact, I believe I just liked a tweet last night on Twitter. It was from a investor at Sousa Ventures who talked a lot about how they look at projections. So yes. Got it. Um, so the question had to do with, uh, from an innovation work standpoint, you know, maybe why are we unique or what do we look for here in Pittsburgh that may be different from a Bay Area VC? So if, um, I didn't really talk as much about innovation works. We have um, funding at different levels. We have uh, 25 to 50K of initial funding uh, for founding teams to help them get the first products and customers through our accelerator programs, Alpha Lab, Alpha Lab Gear. We also have uh, funding in a pre-seed fund uh, that's typically the initial check is 100K, but it could be 50 to 150. Uh, those are for companies that have demonstrated uh, those customers' revenues and some of those, you know, answer some of those questions. And in Riverfront Ventures, we uh, allows us to participate with other VCs when they invest in a uh, growing company. And that initial investment may be 500 to 750,000 with reserves to be able to go past a million. You know, we, we, we allocate reserves. That's a $24 million um, fund. From an innovation work standpoint, you know, we are focused um, uh, on companies that are uh, located here. Um, we do invest across different sectors, uh, the uh, hardware, software, life sciences. I think, you know, in terms of what's unique, because we have you know, those funds at different stages, you know, we, we, we can be probably a little bit more patient than uh, other investors that need to have a certain outcome in a certain time window. And that, uh, and that there's still flexibility for a company to, you know, go the high growth venture raising route, or maybe a modified, you know, raise some money and also, you know, focus on driving revenues, because I think that fits well with the culture here as well, um, here in the, in the Pittsburgh region. I think in contrast, and, but we do look at, hopefully you saw this presentation, we look a lot at what the market, the funding market is looking for, not just here in Pittsburgh, but throughout the country, because we do know that companies uh, that we fund need to be able to raise money not just from Pittsburgh, that you know, they need to be able to raise money, whether it's from the East Coast, Midwest, West Coast. And I think in the Bay Area, because some of the funds are much larger, you know, you've got billion dollar funds. So uh, I think that also lends itself for them kind of putting a lot more money in earlier in a consumer facing company, because that can fund a lot of the customer acquisition and some of the testing um, on those channels. So.